Okay. All right. So it's um, my pleasure to introduce Dan Turan, who was a PhD student at Toronto a couple years ago now, I guess. And he's now um, in Perth, uh, the University of Western Australia, which is at the which is the, it's, okay, wait, the International Center for Radio Astronomy Research. And um, he told me that Perth is kind of like Toronto in the 1950s. This is being recorded, right? <laughs> that was Ray's comment, let's be fair. But with a nicer climate. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> okay, so anyway, um, anyway, so he's going to talk about galaxies, which is his uh, area of expertise. And before mm -hmm. he begins, I'd just like to mention tonight is dinner. If anyone wants to join us for dinner, I'm taking a so just let me know. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, John. And before I begin, I'll thank my corporate masters who are paying for this. So, as John said, I'm at the University of Western Australia, um, but actually at the International Center for Radio Astronomy Research, and that's a collaboration between. University of Western Australia and also Curtin University, which is across the river in Perth and does more, actually a lot more radio astronomy, pulsars, that sort of thing. Um, so it, kind of the reason for ICRAR's existence is mainly to support the SKA, but we also got a fairly large galaxy evolution group, including a theory group, which I'm part of, and also a fair number of optical astronomers who I've been working with as well. Um, and all, so I'm personally funded by CASTRO, the ARC Center for All Sky Astrophysics, um, which you may remember as the institute that Brian Gensler was the uh, director of until he came here. So if you'd like to know more about Australian astronomy, I can tell you a bit more about that later. Um, and just to get you oriented, uh, Western Australia is over there in the west of Australia. There's Perth. and. Uh, it's actually about as far as you can get from Toronto without going into the Indian Ocean. So Perth is basically directly opposite from Bermuda, which is over there. And uh, it's a nice place, sunny, lots of parrots. Uh, feel free to come on down. It takes eight hours and 40 minutes to get there if you fly at top speed in a Concorde. So it's not so bad. <laughs> exactly. OK, so back to galaxies. Um, I'll mainly be talking about how we can really measure fundamental properties of spiral galaxies. And this is, well, you have to start talks like these with showing, showing some kind of Hubble diagram. So this is actually the one from the Spitzer Infrared Nearby Galaxy Survey. And I think actually this poster is outside uh, uh, the lounge in the astronomy building. So what it tells you is there's a fairly wide variety in the properties of spiral galaxies. They range from spirals down here with bars, which I actually excluded because I don't, I'm not gonna, really going to talk about bars in this talk. But they're, they're very nice, clean disks that are basically nothing but an exponential disk, some spiral arms, order of rotation, and nothing more than that. But then as you go typically towards lower, larger mass systems, you get increasing dominance of a centrally concentrated bulge component, which um, sort of has been thought classically as basically a spheroidal, centrally concentrated thing that's mostly supported by dispersion, so random motions instead of ordered rotation in a disk. Um, so trying to measure, you know, a nice single number to say the size of a galaxy or, you know, its rotational velocity is confounded by the fact that most spirals are have at least two or three components in the stars, the bulge, the disk, sometimes bars, spiral arms, etc. But why do you actually want to reduce all this complexity, complexity down to a single number? Well, this was actually historically done first, and I don't know if I'd say better, but it was definitely done first for uh, elliptical galaxies, which are sort of simpler systems. They're spheroids, um, thought to be mainly dispersion supported. Um, just like the bulges of spiral galaxies. And if you try to reduce their properties down to a really fundamental physical measure, so the velocity dispersion sigma, that's a velocity, um, some, side, some sort of size, half light radius, say, um, distance, and a measure of mass, luminosity, or surface brightness. 
you find quite strong correlations between all these properties. And in fact, this particular correlation here, the fundamental plane, has placed some very strong constraints on the formation mechanisms, mechanisms for elliptical galaxies. The scatter in this relation observed is about 0.1 dex, and the intrinsic scatter, depending on how, we, what, how large you think your observational errors are, is consistent with maybe 0.05 or possibly as small as almost zero dex. So that's very puzzling, and this is something I worked on in my PhD. I'm not gonna talk about it much. Um, but it is interesting that systems that may have you know, diverse origins, you know, they come from maybe mergers or accretion of gas or a variety of physical mechanisms, end up following such, such a tight scaling relation. And it was also interesting for cosmologists because um, having such a tight correlation like this, two of these parameters, the dispersion and the surface brightness, are nominally distance independent, although you know surface brightness is not actually distance independent. But it basically gives you a way of um, fairly cheaply inferring the distance of a galaxy. So the fundamental plane has also been used for cosmology in addition to just um, studying galaxy evolution. Now back to spiral galaxies, you can play the same kind of exercise with spiral galaxies, and this is probably one of the better compendiums of scaling relations for spiral galaxies from Courtauld. And again, there's a number of different properties that correlate with each other. The luminosity, um, some sort of measure of velocity. This is typically the peak rotational velocity of the galaxy and the size. So just as in, um, as in elliptical galaxies, these are fairly tight um, relations, but the scatter can be fairly large. So on the order of 0.3 or 0.4 dex instead of you know, as small as 0.1 in elliptical galaxies. So that's, that's an interesting thing, um, especially since a lot of the spiral galaxies, massive spirals we see, haven't had a lot of evolution in the past few billion years. Many of them, like M31, have sort of slowly been forming stars, but not suffering or undergoing um, major mergers or having very strong bouts of star formation. So it's curious that these galaxies, which you think might have more self-similar formation histories than elliptical galaxies, end up having quite a large scatter in their, um, in their scaling relations. So really the question we want to know is, is this something fundamental about galaxy physics or are we just not measuring the right things? Are there systematic biases in how we measure luminosities and sizes and velocities and so on? Another interesting difference between um, spirals and ellipticals is um, their dark matter content. So this has been recently um, not sort of inferred rather than directly measured, um, usually using the dynamics of the galaxy by Courtauld and Dutton. So actually this is a, a compilation of sort of lower mass systems here from the disk mass survey and um, their own uh, measurements of higher mass galaxies to try to extend this across a fairly wide dynamic range in basically circular velocity. So basically what they argue is that low mass spirals have higher dark matter fractions um, measured within something like the half-light radius than at very high mass where the rotation curves are more or less consistent with being dominated by stellar mass rather than dark mass. So that's curious, and it contrasts with elliptical galaxies, which, if you believe this Atlas 3D result, either have very low and basically flat dark matter fractions. I hedge that because um, my own work and a couple of other papers trying to explain the fundamental plane of elliptical galaxies have argued that it has to be actually increasing with mass, radius, whatever you measure. But regardless of whether it's flat or increasing, it's, it's clearly different from the behavior shown by spiral galaxies. So again, the error bars and individual points here are fairly large. If we want to try to understand this and you know, figure out are massive spiral galaxies dark matter dominated or not, are low mass spirals really you know, have the vast majority of their rotation contributed by the dark halo within one scale radius. We need better measurements of the dark matter uh, halo. And the only way to do that is by 
getting better, measuring better dynamics, and also modeling the observations better. So kind of more um, fundamental quantity that's been neglected um, until sort of the last few years or so is angular momentum. So if you think about physical quantities, I mean, the really fundamental ones are energy, mass, angular momentum. And we've sort of been getting at it um, by measuring velocities and dispersions in, um, those are sort of, in an elliptical galaxy, the dispersion is sort of a proxy for, um, for kinetic energy. And in a spiral, if it's dominated by rotation, then the circular velocity is. But we actually, we want to measure the total kinetic energy and the total angular momentum, not you know, some inclination dependent, projection dependent thing. Anyway, so um, these authors, Daniel Obrechkov, um, who's my advisor um, at UWA, and Carl Glazebrook, and also um, there are similar papers by Fall and Romanowski. They measured here on the x-axis baryonic mass, um, that's including stars and um, ionized gas, and I think some estimate for the H1 as well. Angular momentum here on the y-axis. And there's a pretty, more or less a linear correlation between the two, um, but there are some small offsets in the x-direction. And these lines here are some fairly simple models that basically say, if, given the mass of this galaxy, if some fixed fraction of the angular momentum of the halo was transferred to the gas and then into the stars once the gas turned to the stars. How much angular momentum would you have? And these lines are offset for different values of beta. That, that's the bulge fraction, because the bulge is assumed to form through mergers or something else and it doesn't have any net angular momentum. And so these are the actual values of the bulge fraction in the kind of small hard to read text. And they more or less line up to this, along with a simple theoretical model. And now if you plot this baryonic mass, angular momentum, and bulge fraction, it forms actually a fairly tight plane. So this, they're sort of arguing that this is almost a fundamental plane, just like the elliptical one, but with different variables. Angular momentum instead of dispersion. And you know, here they argue it's bulge fraction. It could be something else. But at least there's, there's some evidence that there is a third parameter you can add to spiral galaxies that can give you very tight um, very tight scaling relation. And of course, Windows wants to update right now. I'm going to make it not do that. Oh, no. <sighs> OK. It's an irritating touchpad, I'm sorry. OK, when I'll get back to that, I'll continue the story of angular momentum in spiral galaxies. So I guess while I'm waiting for that to continue, um, the project I've been working on in Australia is um, the SAMI Galaxy, that galaxy survey. That's an integral field survey of um, sort of like manga, if you're aware of that. And I'll go over in a bit once this starts up um, exactly how we measure what we, and what we measure. Um, but the instrument is um, essentially a, a fiber-fed spectrograph that instead of um, individual fibers has 13 so-called hexabundles. These are bundles of um, optical fibers. And each one of these bundles contains 61, 61 individual fibers. So you measure um, basically optical spectra across the face of a galaxy out to about um, 15 arc second field of view. So that gives you spatially resolved kinematics all across the face of the disk. Um, and depending on uh, the size of the galaxy and how nearby it is. It can go out to maybe um, one to two effective radii. Um, and so SAMI is now in its, uh, roughly its third year of observations. We got about 1,800 galaxies, and I'll show you images of some of them once this comes up again. Um, okay, perfect. 
Thank you for updating. Okay, um, yeah, so before I get to that, the bulge fraction was thought to be an important parameter in this paper. I'd actually tried to measure it from Sloan data um, in my thesis. So this is showing in four different bins of um, bulge fraction, the luminosity on the x-axis and the CERSIC index, that sort of measure of the concentration of the bulge. And this is for a few hundred thousand galaxies, which had uh, just sort of traditional two-dimensional bulge disk decompositions based only on Sloan images. And I was interested in this because um, both the bulge fraction and the concentration of the bulge, if you have two spirals merging together, they'll impact the structure of the elliptical you form. But basically I tried to do this and could not tell if there was any relation whatsoever. Basically Sloan images are really not quite good enough to do this. But even if you restrict yourself here, this is um, of a sample of visually classified galaxies, which um, amongst other things were actually had a smaller median redshift, so they're better resolved than your average Sloan galaxy. Even then, I was sort of expecting to see something like at larger luminosity you have, and at larger bulge fraction, you have more concentrated bulges. So uh, values from six to eight are more centrally concentrated, and around one, one is an exponential for the CERSIC index. But again, there may or may not be a linear trend here, but the scatter is about as size at, uh, as large on an individual galaxy as you know, the size of the plot. So it's hard to tell whether there's any relation here. And, and really, the basic problem is that it's difficult to measure bulge fractions from images alone. And this nice figure that I borrowed from Danielle really demonstrates why that is and how you can do better. So here's basically everything, every interesting profile you can measure for a galaxy. So if you have just an optical image like here, you can plot the surface brightness as a function of radius. So if you have an exponential disk, it's exponentially declining. If you have a central bulge, you'll have um, a small peak in the central surface brightness. But for many galaxies in Sloan and other surveys, the size of this peak and the size of the bulge can be comparable to your point spread function. So usually bulges are barely resolved and also they may or may not have much of a, a boost in surface brightness over the, over the contribution from the disk. So that's why it's difficult to do bulge disk decomposition from images alone. Now the answer is to add more data from the data. And what can you measure? So if you have a fiber, um, fiber-fed spectrograph like Sloan, you can measure really only the, only the velocity dispersion because you can't measure changes in the mean velocity without having you know, a long slit or multiple measurements across the face of the galaxy. So if your galaxy has some dispersion profile, um, let's say it's bulge dominated in the middle, it has a large dispersion. As you go further out, disks tend to have lower dispersion, so your dispersion drops. And the central dispersion can tell you whether there really is a bulge there or not. But again, a single spectrum in the center of your galaxy only measures a small fraction of that. And there's also another issue with this, which I'll explain in a little bit. So integral field spectroscopy can constrain both the dispersion and the rotation curve out to basically either where your fibers end or where the signal to noise gets too low to actually measure um, anything. I'll say exactly what we measure. And one more data point that is sometimes but not always used is the 21 centimeter spectrum. So the galaxies I'll be talking about, they're all quite distant so you can't actually resolve the 21 centimeter mission. But if you have just the integrated 21 centimeter spectrum and you measure, this is basically the part of the disk that's um, one side of the disk is rot moving away from you, one side of the disk is moving towards you, and if you measure the width of this, it's basically um, of the 21 centimeter spectrum, it's basically a measurement of your, the rotational velocity of the disk. Um, usually thought to be the maximum circular velocity, but that depends how far the H1 disk goes. 
So that can really give you a constraint on the rotation velocity, even if your IFU data doesn't go far enough to actually reach the peak of the rotation curve in a galaxy. OK. So I'll explain SAMI just a little bit, but I'll introduce some results that are coming out, should be accepted pretty soon. Um, from Luca Cortese, he's also at UWA and a SAMI member. And he's tried to measure, again, angular momentum. And this is using uh, a subset of SAMI galaxies for which we have both um, gas kinematics from the emission lines and stellar kinematics from the absorption lines. So here uh, are various plots. The difference between these are, um, this is all measuring the angular momentum within an effective radius because the IFU data typically doesn't go much further than that. And um, yeah, so the, on the left-hand side, the galaxies are color-coded by just um, visual morphology. So going from very late type spirals in the blue to ellipticals in the red. And here they're color coded by um, CIRSIC index, which is another proxy for morphology. And basically what you see is all, all the blue galaxies, as you expect, have very large, um, this is actually specific angular momentum, so the total angular momentum divided by the stellar mass. And at fixed stellar mass, the, the more early type your morphology, the less angular momentum you have. And that's basically because elliptical galaxies don't rotate much, and spiral galaxies do almost nothing but rotate. Okay, so this is basically another attempt to get um, sort of a unified scaling relation that explains both how spiral galaxies and elliptical galaxies form at the same time. Um, the other difference between the two panels on the top and the left, I think this is projected angular momentum, and this is an attempt to correct for inclination and projection effects. Um, so that's another avenue where you, you need modeling, and because the, if your bulge is a sphere, then inclination doesn't matter. You, you'll measure the same dispersion, basically, no matter which direction you look. But for disks, obviously, the more inclined it is, the higher rotation you measure. If it's face on, you measure nothing. So it's important to get that inclination correction correct. OK, so this is just a quick explanation of how integral field spectroscopy works. You have a beautiful spiral galaxy. Hopefully, they're not actually this dusty, but some, some really are. OK, and this is the typical aperture a Sloan spectrum would measure. It's basically going only after the bulge and maybe the inner parts of the disk. So you have no information on the outer parts of the disk. You have no idea how, how quickly the disk is rotating. OK, so the answer is, put, is to put a whole bunch of different fibers, smaller fibers, across the face of the galaxy. And this is an actual picture of one of the SAMI hexabundles. It's called a hexabundle because it's a bundle of 61 fibers that are arranged roughly hexagonally, and they're sort of glued together. Um, and here is me pretending to be an observer. This is what the actual instrument looks like. So each one of these metal cables is one of these hexabundles. There are 13 of them. And so 12 go on galaxies, and one goes on a star to measure the point spread function and do flux calibration. And all the other cheaper, flexible orange ones are there to measure the sky. Um, and this picture is kind of a lie. They didn't let me plug, plug them in. They're actually very fragile. So you need to be careful when you're plugging them in. They've got these magnetic connectors to pull them in and out. Anyway, so in the end, you get these 61 fibers going across the face of the galaxy. Now, astronomers don't like to deal with um, weird irregular grids like this. So we take the data and we bin it into your traditional square pixel. We call them spaxels because they're spatial pixels. Um, you'll also notice there are some gaps between the fibers. and um, we actually deal with that by taking seven different exposures that are slightly offset to try to get uniform coverage. OK, so in each of these spaxels, you sum up some fraction of the flux from a bunch of different fibers, and you get an observed spectrum. The continuum tells you about you know, the stellar populations in the galaxy. And all the information on kinematics comes from these absor stellar absorption lines. Um, well, OK. so the the gas kinematics comes from the emission lines, but I'm not going to talk about that uh, in this talk. So you model it as best you can. You 
try to pick um, some star formation history or a collection of um, model spectra that reproduce this. Um, and typically, okay, and you redshift your model spectrum too. And typically, your model spectrum should have um, smaller widths in these absorption lines than the observed one because galaxies have a distribution of velocities in their stars which smear out the absorption lines. Okay, so you, to optimize the fit, you try to fit uh, some kind of velocity distribution for the stars, con convolve that with a model spectrum, and reproduce the observed one. So all of the kinematic maps I'll show you are basically the mean velocity from this fit and the dispersion from this fit. I should also say um, Sammy is placed on the Anglo-Australian telescope, which since Australia doesn't have the tallest mountains in the world, doesn't always have particularly good weather and seeing conditions. So your galaxy image is not, is rarely ever that beautiful. It's usually smeared by a point spread function of one to two or even three arc seconds at a time. So your actual model galaxy will look something like that. Okay, so where is SAMI at? Like I said, we're actually approaching 2,000 galaxies. And here's a plot showing um, star formation rate versus the stellar mass of the galaxies that have been, been observed as of about six months ago. So it's actually a little bit behind. This is showing the gas kinematics. And really what I want to highlight is we're basically probing the entire so-called star forming main sequence of spiral galaxies. All of these little blue and red curves are shown are basically the rotation curves of each galaxy in the gas. So we have a very large number of rotationally supported systems. Down here are the elliptical galaxies or early types that are fairly massive and are just not forming very many stars. Um, so they don't have much in the way of ionized gas emission. That's another reason why you don't see anything in those maps. But you do see uh, stellar absorption lines. So anyway, there's a number of papers out already. Um, we're going to have an emission line data release coming up in the next few weeks, hopefully. And all of this data will be publicly available to download. Um, the stellar kinematics that I'm going to show you are still in prep, and they'll be coming out probably in the next year or so. OK, having said all of that, here's what an actual spiral galaxy looks like from SAMI. OK, so here's our flux map. Your velocity field, this has clear signatures of a disk. It's going from about minus 150 to plus 150 kilometers a second. And there's the dispersion map. Now, one of the nice things about SAMI, it's got fairly, should have shown here, it covers a fairly wide range of stellar mass, almost three decks. And we've got a, a large amount of um, ancillary data, uh, from mainly from the Gamma Galaxy Survey. And amongst uh, some of that ancillary data that's coming out are these very nice deep optical images from um, the KIDS survey. So KIDS is mainly designed to do weak lensing, but it also does some, some galaxy evolution. And this lets us, um, these images are basically two magnitudes deeper than Sloan and with better seeing because the telescope's in Chile. So this really lets you measure um, the surface bright brightness profile of the disk out to more or less where the disk will end. Um, also lets us better spatially resolve the bulge because you can't really make out what's going on here in the flux map just because our seeing is not very good in SAMI. Okay, so let me tell you a bit about the 3D modeling I've been doing. Um, so in order to get around all these problems with measuring inclinations and bulge facts and so on, I've been using um, an ice code that John developed here called Galactics. And what Galactics does is basically set up um, equilibrium initial conditions for galaxies with an exponential disk, a cersic bulge, and some generalized dark matter halo. Okay, I won't go into great detail about how exactly it works, but the very nice thing about it is that it takes these sort of analytic distribution functions that would generate a stable disk and a stable bulge and a stable halo if they were, there was only one component. But if you just paste three different components together, they won't be in equilibrium. So you need to make some kind of corrections. And Galactics computes all those corrections and spits out a slightly adjusted model that's in perfect equilibrium. 
So this is great for n-body initial conditions because rather than in some other codes where you have to take your model galaxy and sort of let it re-equilibrate itself um, after a few dynamical times, it's just in equilibrium right away. That's very important for modeling because you don't have the computing time. You can't just you know, take your model and then you know, spend a thousand CPU hours waiting for it to evolve to stability and then evaluate it again a thousand times. That's computationally prohibitive. So I've come up with a new integration method that's quite a bit faster and you need that because if you want to model a galaxy you need to evaluate, you need to make you know, thousands of different um, combinations of parameters to try to reproduce the data. Um, so here's basically how the integration scheme works. So if you look at the disk face on, it's going to be symmetric in, um, well, it's going to be circularly symmetric. So we split it up into radial bins. This is a fairly small number of bins just to show you exactly how it works. So we evaluate the density of points not only spatially, but also in each of the three velocity directions. So radial, tangential, and vertical. Okay, this is what it looks like edge on. So it's a very thin disk. And once you incline it, you get something like this. And these weird things you see, that's just moiré patterns from taking an ellipse and binning it into square pixels. That's a very low resolution model. For the actual fitting I'm going to show you, we use far more bins than that. So why do we bother with 3D models? So this is um, a plot showing you all the data from that galaxy and then the predictions from our model. And it sort of loops through going from the best fit to face on where you see no rotation. And then it's going to loop down to edge on. And this shows you how the residuals change as you change, in this case, only the inclination and leave all the other model parameters fixed. So basically the answer to why do you want to do 3D, it's because galaxies are 3D. So uh, um, you could do with a 2D model, but in fact, um, you go back here, within each radial um, ellipse, if you will, there are contributions from stars that are in the midplane of the disk at that radius, but also stars that are above and below the midplane of the disk at different radii. And here's uh, just an explanation for why I said I was dissecting disks. So here's your data. This is what the model looks like with a bulge in the disk. This is with just the disk component, and here is with just the bulge component. So the bulge contributes to the velocity dispersion. It has no rotational velocity whatsoever, so you get this nice kind of salmon color. And similarly, the disk has a fairly low velocity dispersion, but very large, nice, neat, regular rotation. So there's one effect that's particularly irksome um, when you try to model kinematics, and it's called beam smearing. So this is the same model I showed you before, this is convolved with what we think the point spread function is. And this is without the point spread function. So, of course, your surface brightness profile changes when you convolve something with the at atmospheric scene. But it also changes your velocity and your dispersion. So you'll notice here, the dispersion is quite a bit larger than it is intrinsically. And the reason for that is, you're taking light, basically. So if you measure the dispersion at the center of your galaxy, with a point spread function, it takes light from here where there's a mean velocity and from over here where there's a mean velocity and smooths it in there. So it takes rotational velocity from your disk and turns it into dispersion. So it's important to model this effect and you basically, it's very difficult to correct for it without making a real model. Um, So here's the best fit for this particular galaxy. Um, I'm not sure why it's showing up like that. But anyway, um, I've actually tried to do a, a better job at not underestimating the errors on our galaxy. But you can see it fits reasonably well. Um, and even though, well, OK, the residuals look large here, but we actually haven't put in the systematics in our flux calibration, which should actually make our errors roughly 10 times larger. Um, but anyway, uh, you could see it more or less reproduces what we see. And the actual parameters we get, we get a disk 
log disk mass of you know, 10 to the 10, almost 10 to the 11. That's actually roughly consistent with the stellar mass that we get from, from gamma with a completely different method that was basically doing fitting the multiband photometry. And it's going in more or less the correct direction because we haven't accounted for dust obscuration and so on, whereas they attempted to do that. The other nice thing is even though I only fitted the SAMI kinematics and the kids' images, we get a circular velocity at a reasonably large radius of about 210 kilometers a second. And that's consistent with um, this galaxy also has an H1 detection. And that H1 velocity, if you use the inclination we get, is almost the same, even though we haven't used it as part of the fit. The halo is um, actually a little less than 10 times the mass of the stars, which is a little low. Um, but actually, these parameters, you tend to get a slightly larger halo mass if you include this H1 velocity as a constraint. Um, basically, if you're only fitting the kinematics out to you know, one exponential disk length, then you have no constraint on the outer part of the halo density profile at all. So uh, the error bars on that are fairly large. OK, so uh, we do not just maximum likelihood liquid fitting, but also Bayesian MCMC. Now, this plot is a little bit out of date. Um, but the point of this is that there are correlations between all the parameters. And the correlations are not necessarily a nice ellipse. So you'd like to understand how the parameters are covariant. That's why you do the Bayesian fitting. But the problem I found is you actually get extremely um, extremely small error bars. So I'm not going to go through all the parameters, but for the disk mass, we were getting errors on the order of 1%, even half a percent. And this, this really puzzled me. Um, the data are pretty good, but they are not that good. And we especially see um, a very clear degeneracy between the disk mass and the disk mass to light ratio, um, which is more or less as you expect. It's kind of linearly degenerate. and but for, for reasons that I'll explain in a bit, the actual, um, the one and two sigma errors um, around the best fit are, are very small, even though the degeneracy extends quite a bit. So in order to understand this, I actually sort of went back to 2D modeling. Um, and with um, a collaborator, Aaron Robotham at um, UWA, we've developed a new, better 2D fitting code. So here is just the R-band image from kids and the best fit bulge plus 2D bulge plus disk model. And one thing you'll see right away, these are the residual. So this is just data minus model over error, what I call chi. And you'll notice they don't quite follow a normal distribution. There's a tail of outliers here. And similarly, if you plot um, chi squared, so just the distribution of data minus model over error squared, it follows a chi-squared distribution up to a certain point, and then there's this tail of um, pixels that are not very well fit. And it's actually more or less the sum of chi-squared and a t distribution. And you see where most of these residuals come from is the spiral arms um, near the center of the galaxy, and also the sort of the gap between where the spiral arms meet at the center of the galaxy. And you see more or less the same thing in the G-band. I won't explain that. OK, so why did I want to write another 2D code? I was just amused by this, uh, this image from XKCD. There are several others on the market, but they didn't quite do exactly what I wanted them to do. Um, I won't go through the full list. But the main thing is a lot of them are closed source and not open source. They use pretty bad optimizers. Um, Few of them support any kind of MCMC methods to get robust errors. Um, and a lot of them also just don't do integration and convolution particularly accurately or quickly. So I wanted to really nail down the source of why do I get these tiny error bars? Um, and also sort of compare results um, between the 2D and 3D modeling. I won't go through the list of things we do better. There's a lot of them. Um, the thing I will highlight is that, in principle, once all this is working, you should be able to not only fit your galaxy, but also fit 
all of those irritating calibration things that go into the galaxy fitting simultaneously and get um, a better handle on your um, on not just the correlation between galaxy parameters, but the correlations between galaxy parameters and the point spread function and the sky background and so on. Um, I also wanted to figure out exactly what's going on, um, how to deal with the covariance in the data, because all astronomical optical images have a point spread function, and that introduces covariance, because pixels that are side by side are not independent, they share a large fraction of the flux with each other. I don't have an answer to that just yet, but anyway. So here are the a lot uh, computationally cheaper and nicer looking uh, probability distribution functions for just a bulge plus disk fit of the R-band image. And the only thing I'm going to highlight is, uh, it's a bit hard to read it, but anyway, are the, all the correlations are more or less what you expect. Size is degenerate with um, luminosity for the disk and luminosity of the disk is degenerate with a sky background and so on. But the errors on the magnitude of the disk are again very small, less than 1%. And I still stubbornly did not believe that. So I did a fairly simple test. I said, if we take our best fit model and using what we know about the properties of the detector and the exposure time and so on, and generate one Monte Carlo iteration of that model, so this is what the galaxy would look like if it was a perfect Cersic bulge plus exponential disk plus the PSF that we think it has. So if I take that perfect galaxy um, with real observational noise, just random Poisson noise, and fit it with a model again, what kind of errors do I get? So this is just showing the actual model image. There's a bit of noise in there the perfect model, and the residuals, as you expect, are perfectly described by a normal distribution and a chi-squared distribution. And there's no residual greater than four sigma, or plus or minus four sigma. So this works. Now if I go through the whole exercise again of doing the MCMC -MC fitting, um, these are all the relevant parameters, the bulge magnitude, disk magnitude, bulge and disk size. Um, so the blue dot are the input parameters that went into the model. And the red is the, is the mean from the fit. OK. <laughs> We're over here. Anyway, the bottom line from this is that the actual one sigma errors you get on the disk magnitude are about four to five times larger than from fitting the actual image. So this kind of puzzled me. And it's a bit weird, because actually this, this is not fitting with a point spread function at all. This is just taking your model and gridding it onto the same spatial scale. So how is it possible that you have a model that's data that's perfectly described by your model, no observational systematics whatsoever, and you get worse constraints on your model, worse constraints on your model parameters than you did with your, you know, your real galaxy with spiral arms and possibly unknown systematics. And I think there's actually a pretty simple explanation for this. This is in a nice paper by Andre called "Do's and Don'ts of Reduced Chi Squared." Um, and so what they were arguing is, suppose you have two data points like this. Um, and your model is a line that's constrained to have um, a positive slope and not a negative one. So they were arguing, well, if you put a prior like that on your model, then that changes your number of free parameters. And therefore, for basically all nonlinear models, there's, you can't even compute what the number of true free parameters is. So basically, you shouldn't use reduced chi-squared ever. There's another point that's kind of interesting here is that if this were your model, suppose we don't try to fit the slope at all, and we just fit the intercept, and that's it. So we have two data points, one free parameter. This will be your best fit. I sort of eyeballed this, and both of these points are roughly 3.5 sigma away. So if you move this up 0.5 sigma, suddenly this point will deviate 3 sigma, and this will be 4 sigma, and your chi-squared doubles. So if this is your model and you constrain it to have no slope whatsoever, it has very little wiggle room in how much it can move around. It basically has to go right to the mean of your data. Now, 
if you were to fit a slope, then you know you could fit it going right to the center of your points. You could fit one touching the bottom of this and then the top of that error bar. So you would have much broader um, errors on the slope of your line. So I think that's basically what's happening here. Um, so let me show you. Ah, right. So all the residuals, well not all, but most of the residuals come from non-axisymmetric features like the spiral arms. So if you were to measure, say, the surface brightness in an ellipse, when you go over a spiral arm, the density goes up, and when you go in the trough between spiral arms, the density go, goes down. So it's basically like a sinusoid. And our model is axisymmetric. So it's like fitting a straight line through a sinusoid. So I think that's basically the reason why we're getting all these very small error bars. We are not able to fit the non-axisymmetric features. So all, all it tells us is that we can't change the mean very much from basically the average in each azimuthal bin. Otherwise, we get a bad fit. So I think what this argues is if you're going to actually use MCMC to derive the errors on data that has, on a model that basically doesn't fit your data very well, you're better off making a Monte Carlo realization of your data given the observational parameters and fitting that. And that will give you, I think, not not even um, a better estimate of the errors, but a lower bound on what the errors on your model parameters should be. Basically, you shouldn't be able to get better constraints on model parameters from data that is not well fit by the model than by data that is well fit by the model. OK. Um, you wouldn't agree with that? Whereas I would interpret the Monte Carlo error bars as telling me, mm -hmm. assuming that the model that you're fitting is the God given truth, um, how well do I know this parameter? And it doesn't tell me anything about how well it fits the data. Well, yeah, it is true that. that Really? I mean, yes, it's true that this is, well, there's no obvious answer to if you have, if your model, if your data is perfectly described by your model and then you pass it through, you know, your, you add some Poisson noise and you use some particular fitting method, there's no obvious answer to how large the error bars on the parameters should be. I, I think that's true. But I think it's fair to argue that as your, as your data gets less well fit by your model, I don't think your parameters should shrink until they get to basically nothing, or, or the errors on each parameter. I mean, it's true that there is only a small area of parameter space that gives you an optimal fit. Um, and formally, that optimal fit is much better than all the other suboptimal fits with slightly different parameter values. But that's because the fits are driven by the non-axisymmetric features, not by the actual, you know, the actual exponential disk scale length. In other words, it's not that you don't have a good constraint on you know, your exponential disk scale length or something. It's that you're fitting features that are not related to the scale length. Anyway, I'm going to give that some more thought and maybe submit a paper on that at some point, and you're free to read it and give me your thoughts. OK, so where is all this going? I only showed you one galaxy. I was kind of tempted to just fit a second one and then plot those two points and fit a line and call that a scaling relation, but no. Um, we're still trying to work out some details of the modeling and this whole business of should we bother going through all the MCMC uh, just to get tiny error bars that we don't believe. But once we've settled that and uh, sort of made the whole process a little more efficient, we'll be able to get fully realistic 3D bulge disk halo models. There'll be better physical models and you'll give improved parameter constraints. Um, as for the actual data, when Sammy's done, we'll have at least 3,000 galaxies with 
not all of them will have great data, but they'll all have some constraints on spatially resolved dynamics. Once you extend this to all of the galaxies, the, the kids imaging will probably cover 100, 200,000 galaxies. And all of them are going to have red chips and central fiber spectra. So you could do all this modeling even without having the, the rotation curve um, and just use you know, your imaging data and the central, um, the central spectra as a constraint on the bulge dispersion. And that should be better than just fitting the imaging alone. In a few years, once the SKA is up and running, basically all of these galaxies should have H1 detections. Um, if they have H1 in the first place. So that'll give you at least a constraint on the circular velocity at some large radius, even if you don't have the whole rotation curve. So I think in three to five years, once we've nailed down the methods and got all this data, um, we have a pretty good chance of nailing all these spiral galaxy scaling relations. Um, might have constraints on the IMF and dark matter as well. And cosmologists might be happy too, because from the 3D modeling, you should be able to get a better Tully Fisher relation. Um, and also, um, even just the 2D modeling should be able to give you better uh, shapes for weak lensing. After all, that's what KIDS is designed to do. Uh, I didn't think I have a lot of time to talk about this, but I am also working on simulations. Um, so, one of the simulations I'm using is this new. Romulus um, cosmological box led by um, the end body shop at Washington, mainly by Michael Trammell. So um, the main purpose of the simulation, um, sort of a 25 megaparsec volume. Uh, so it's getting halos up to around 10 to the 13. And it's resolving galaxies quite nicely. And they've got a, a nice new model for black hole dynamics. Um, so basically what they've done is they've set the mass of the dark matter particles to be the same as the, st as the gas and star particles instead of 10 times larger. And they have a nice prescription for dynamical friction for a black holes to settle into the center of the halo. So this is an improvement over sort of arbitrary methods of taking your black hole and sticking it in the middle of your halo after a merger, which is what you have to do if you have large uh, mass dark matter particles, because otherwise the dark matter particles can scatter your low mass black holes artificially. So here's an example of one of the most massive galaxies in the simulation. So what I've been doing is making mock images of these galaxies um, with the same code I used to make the mock images for the models. Um, so I make, in this case, a Sloan image and a SAMI velocity and dispersion map. <coughs> and we try to see if these, this simulation reproduces the same scaling relations we see with SAMI, just with observed data, not with modeling. Um, and I picked this example in particular because the velocity field, there's clearly a bar in there, looks quite a lot like the Korean Air logo, and that amused me. So anyway, here's very preliminary results on what we've measured. Um, so here's size luminosity for all the SAMI galaxies. They're color coded uh, by lambda r, which is more or less a proxy for specific angular momentum. So as you expect, um, Again, there's sort of a gradient where galaxies with more, um, yeah, so the, the bluer galaxies have more angular momentum, so they're more likely to be disks or have disks. And the disk galaxies tend to be larger at fixed luminosities than the ellipticals. So we've measured both size mass, um, size and specific angular momentum, um, and size and velocity dispersion. And I've done the same. At this point, I only had the snapshot for redshift 0.75. Um, by now, pretty close to being done. And I was trying to see if we had the same broad general trends. And it looks like we reproduce the luminosity dispersion relation. Angular, angular momentum uh, relation is quite a bit steeper. And the size mass is kind of disappointingly flat. In fact, there's no clear difference between, so basically, these are the the spiral galaxies here, the yellow and blue points, have a shallow slope. And the early type galaxies in the red have a steeper slope there. So it's not as, clear, not as clearly defined of a blue sequence of spiral galaxies. This actually is a kind of general problem in cosmological simulations. Um, I'm not able to show it, but someone um, has done a fairly similar exercise with a lustrous simulation, a paper that should be submitted soon. And they find almost a perfectly flat 
size luminosity relation when they go through all the effort of making mock images and fitting them with a bulge plus disk, 2D bulge plus disk models. And so far, the only simulation I'm aware of that has actually solved this is the Eagle simulation. And really, the only way they did it is they took their sort of standard subgrid model, which actually didn't work particularly well at low masses and had a similarly flat um, um, uh, size luminosity relation. They did some magical tuning of the parameters, recalibrated them for their smaller box size because they were unfortunately resolution dependent and added, I think it was some kind of um, density and metallicity dependent cooling and star formation. Um, and only that was able to reproduce, actually by this data, a very outdated size luminosity relation from Sloan. So this is um, still very much a challenge for um, galaxy formation simulations. So you might see every time someone comes out with a new uh, cosmological box, they show you their stellar mass functions and they say, well, look, we got, all, we got the stellar mass, um, maybe the luminosity functions if they're brave. We got all that down and nailed. But they rarely ever show you the, the size stellar mass or size luminosity and dispersion luminosity relations. Those tend to not work as well. Um, so I think that's basically the area where simulations need to go, not just you know, trying to reproduce abundances of um, galaxies, but all of the scaling relations simultaneously. Um, I guess I'll skip this because I'm running out of time, but people have actually tried to do bulge disk decomposition from the full 60 phase space information from simulations. And there was an interesting paper from um, using a, a sample of zoom simulations of individual halos. And basically the red histograms, this is um, the distribution of angular momentum in, in the z direction. So basically uh, things that, stars that are rotating are gonna have large values of angular momentum um, relative to the next net angular momentum of the system. And the red ones are <coughs> um, basically two different distributions. The blue ones are consistent with the disk and the red ones are consistent with the bulge. Um, so what this paper is saying is more or less that uh, many galaxies do have it, in this case, a distinct set of stars with low angular momentum, like a bulge, and a disk with high angular momentum. But perhaps confusingly, there are also a number where these histograms are really not clearly separated, like these three here. So it's not clear, do those have a bulge and a disk? Are they triaxial things with some sort of radially varying rotation and isotropy? Who knows? Um, they also claim they get completely different results from their 2D versus 3D bulge disk decomposition, but I'm, I'm still a little skeptical of that. Okay, so I will just add to my previous summary um, from the modeling side. We are getting close to getting robust predictions from simulations. People are starting to take seriously the whole concept of making realistic mock, sim mock simulations and try to measure all of your um, physical parameters the same way observers do. Um, so I'm working on a number of these projects. You can ask me about it later. I am a little bit interested in seeing how this whole 60 bulge disk decomposition goes and whether you can learn something from this independently of, of the way we measure bulge and disk fractions in the observed data. Um, I think that's actually something we can do with similar techniques as I've been using, but I just haven't had time to do it. So I will end there and take questions. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to make a figure about that and actually sort of quantify it a little better. But, so let's say your data, instead of these two data points, was a sinusoid, like that. And our model, so that's what, that would be the surface brightness in, say, an elliptical annulus at the same radius in the disk. 
So our model is only ever going to predict a single value for any why, given why annulus. Would you, why would you take the data and average it as a mutual dispersion? You can do that. There are two problems with it. One is which annulus do you smooth it over? Um, because it'll depend. Like if you have a very massive, like that particular galaxy didn't have much of a bulge, but there are galaxies with more massive bulges. And so if your bulge is round and your disk is very elliptical, then your annuli will change in shape with radius. So you could try to model that. Um, but I'm sort of hesitant to re-bin the data again, knowing that there's, they're already so highly covariant. The second problem is if you use small, like thin annuli, and you want to use thin annuli because you, know, you don't want it to be larger than um, the variation. Like you don't want it to be too large or you're not probing the same physical scales. But the smaller you make them, you get a lower signal to noise, and also the bins get very highly correlated. So if your annulus is smaller than your point spread function, then the integrated flux in each annulus is going to be very degenerate with the integrated flux in the annulus next to it. And that sort of compounds onto the problem of the covariance that us galaxy fitters have been ignoring for ages. And I don't really have an answer to that. The, the covariance just comes from the Yeah, so basically the thing you want to fit is the light distribution of the galaxy without the point spread function. I mean, you don't really care what the blurred image of the galaxy look like. looks like. You want the underlying light distribution. But the thing you measure, each pixel is correlated with the other. And as far as I know, every galaxy fitting software out there assumes each data point is independent of the other. And they're just not. And unfortunately, this problem is significantly worse for the SAMI data because we're taking seven independent measurements that are slightly offset in order to get to cover the holes between the fibers. And then each paxel, we combine weighted sums of those seven independent measurements. And so that introduces extra covariance even beyond the point spread function. Um, and the same actually is true of the, the kids' images that I showed. Um, they're taken from a camera that has 32 CCDs, and they actually do five dithered pointings to cover the gaps between the chips. And then they rebin their images to a slightly smaller pixel scale than the native one. So each one of those steps takes your data and correlates pixels with nearby pixels even more than they are originally. And that's a problem that it can actually be solved by, if I were to say, take my model and just try to reproduce the flux using the actual fiber geometry we have. Um, that's something I may try to do when I have more time. For the moment, we're just sort of generically assuming the velocities and the dispersions are known. And they actually come from a whole different fitting process. But that's the best we can do for now. <laughs>